Christmas and allowing us to be here. Um, we'll go ahead and get started with the congregational song. Let's all stand, grab a church hymnal, turn to page 370 at the bottom of the page, and we'll sing Revive Us Again. Son of thy love for Jesus who died and is now gone above. Hallelujah, climb the glory. Hallelujah, amen. Hallelujah, climb the glory. Revive us again. All glory. singing awful good brother jamie we ought to do either another song or do a little right. bit more of that that'll get you good and woke up on this yeah, monday morning y'all ain't used to being in church this time on a monday morning <laughs> yeah, and it, you already your system has already went through the shock of the time change yeah, and now your body is saying i'm not in church at 9 8 45 what time is it i don't even know <laughs> I am a basket case. I have been walking around talking to myself all morning trying to figure some of these situations out. We have had more chaos in the day that I'm talking about in all the 29 years that we've done this. There's been more disruption in one 24 hour, hour period of time than we've ever experienced. And we're still going through it today. We've got sickness among our people. Uh, they're not here, so you can rest easy on that. Uh, and I have some a couple things I want you to pray about. And uh, uh, Brother Ronnie Bearfield was supposed to preach tomorrow night, and Brother Barry Spears was supposed to preach tonight. And Brother Spears called me last week. And I, I want you to make this a matter of prayer. We're going to pray here in a little bit. His, his daughter and, and son-in-law were expecting their first child. And the doctors informed them that the baby's skull is not developing and that their child's not going to make it. And so they have to meet this afternoon at 3 o'clock to counsel with the doctors on this situation. So I want you to pray for Brother Spears and his family. He won't be here today. He's coming in tomorrow night. Brother Ronnie Bearfield was on his way to, uh, he was flying in today from Mississippi. And uh, it's hard when you're flying from outside the country to get there. <laughs> when you're leaving a foreign country and coming to the United States, it's hard, to, uh, flights are difficult. But anyway, uh, Brother uh, Bearfield's flight this morning, they would not allow him to get on it. There's a 45-minute cutoff, and he got there just beyond the 45-minute cutoff. So he's had to catch a later flight, and he'll be into Tri-Cities Airport about 3 this evening. And he's, uh, I knew he'd be too weary to try to preach tonight. So anybody, we got it covered. Uh, we got a preacher coming tonight. Brother Jeremy Simpson's going to be here and preach for us tonight. And uh, so uh, we've got that covered. Uh, pray for... Uh, Brother Eddie Smith, Brother Eddie's sick, my assistant, he's sick, so he's not here this morning. So, as I said, we've got all kinds of disruption, but I have a feeling the Lord wants to help us. I'm going to tell you, hell don't fight something that, that God ain't using. And so you just pray, we're going to pray for one another. People are hungry after two years of chaos and 
and all that we've been through, people are just, we, we ain't here to grind axes and we ain't here to fight one another. We're here to get help. And that's exactly what this meeting's about. And I'm going to tell you something, that these people get help, and I'm glad for that. Boy, we need it, don't we? Have you got something else to sing, Jamie? Sing a little bit more. Amen. Praise God. I'll fly away. Some glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. Celestial shore, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. When the shadows of this life and Like a bird from prison bars have flown, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, I'll fly away. oh glory. I'll fly away in the morning when I die. Hallelujah, by and by. I'll Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away, I'll fly away, I'll fly away, I'll fly away. Today we want to do this. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. And these requests that I've mentioned today, we want to especially take them uh, to God in prayer. Pray for Brother Barefield as he's trying to get here today. And then also for uh, Brother Barry Spears' family during a very difficult time. We have several in our congregation that are sick. and But I'm thankful we, the musicians helping us. Uh, uh, Brother Johnny plays guitar for us. He's sick this week and he's, he's not able to be here. And so... Uh, we're thankful for everybody's coming in to help us, whatever you're doing. We're glad to have you, and we're glad to have all the men of God here today. I realize Monday's a hard day uh, for most preachers, and y'all here this morning, that's a great blessing. We want to go to the Lord in prayer. And let's, I want to ask everybody at Canon Wheel, just come and gather around the altar, and let's start with an altar of prayer today, and let's pray for these needs. And you, I know you've all got needs and burdens, and uh, your church families have needs, and and so we want to just go to Lord in prayer today. And if you're not coming, you can just be seated today. And we're going to gather here and just ask God to help us. Pray for every preacher that will preach today and uh, the singers, everything that's done. May it bring glory and honor to God. And uh, let's just pray that God will help us today. Let's pray uh, today. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day that you've given us. God, on this Monday morning, what sometimes is disruption to us has not caught you by surprise. Father, you do all things well, and we know that you've ordered this, this day just like you desire to do it for, for our lives. And I ask you, Father, now that you'd help us today. Lord, I thank you for these, our friends that have come today. Some have driven a long ways to be here. And Lord, I pray would you bless each one. Bless the men of God that will stand this morning. Give them that that we need, Father, I pray today. May they speak a word in season, God, to us to help us in the midst of the struggles of life. God, I thank you for what you've already done yesterday in the services, how our hearts been cheered. Now, Lord, I pray would you help us all that we might be drawn near to you, Father, in these days of meeting. Oh, God, how we need you, Lord. We, we need you, Father. Oh, God, we need you. 
And Lord, I ask you to help us today. Lord, if there's somebody here with a heavy burden or some need in their life, I pray that today, God, would you do a work of grace in every heart and every life. And Father, we're going to thank you for what you've done. Thank you for what you're going to do. Oh, Lord, I pray, bless us now, Father. And Lord, we're going to give you praise. Oh, thank you, Lord. Yes, God. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Hallelujah. Oh, praise his name. Yes, God. Oh, Lord, help us, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen today. Hallelujah to his name. Amen. Amen. I appreciate the good time of prayer. Always helps to talk to the Lord, don't it? I'm glad we have that privilege, access to the throne of God. I appreciate that. We're honored today to have our friend, and he, for, I don't know how it fell this way, but for the last several years, he's kicked off every Monday morning the first message of the Jubilee. Brother David Montgomery, pastor of the Gravel Hill Baptist Church down in Johnson City, Tennessee. Brother David's our friend, and we're honored to have him today. You hear him gladly today. Amen. Bless you, preacher. You, brother. Amen. I've been told that after I get done, it can't go but one way, and that's up. Amen. <laughs> brother David Shelton come in a while ago, and I run back there to shake his hand and hug his neck. He, uh, he said, preacher, I'm in need of a, a good outline. I said, well, you're going to have to get it from somebody else because I stole this one off you. <laughs> Amen. Turn, if you would, please, to the book of uh, Philippians. Philippians chapter number 4. And yeah, just so you'll know, I'm a nervous wreck. But it, ne it never falls any other way. I had my pastor tell me some years ago, he said, I said, preacher, I'm always nervous when I get up. I said, when will that stop? He said, son, I've been pastoring for 50 years. You're going to have to ask somebody who's been in it longer than I have. I still get that way. He also said, if I didn't get nervous, I'd quit. It's time to stop because we're doing this for the Lord. Amen. Philippians chapter number four. Turn to, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. Now, I'll give you this real quickly this morning. Get out of the way and let these other men of God preach. Uh, Philippians chapter 4, verse number 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Well, I'm glad we've got him to rejoice in. Luke 10 Verse number 20, notwithstanding in this rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. I was reading this scripture and I, I'm always interested in the words and, and the meaning of the words and I want to see what the Lord is saying to us and I looked that word rejoice up, and it said to be exceedingly glad. I thought, man, if there's anybody in this world that's got a reason to be exceedingly glad, it's a child of God. I mean, listen, folks, we, we as God's people, I, I know we have problems. I, I know we have burdens, and I know we go through things that, that a lot of other people may not go through, but I'm also uh, knowing that God is there with us, and if anybody can rejoice in problems, if anybody can rejoice in trouble, it ought to be the child of God. Be exceedingly glad. I thought, now, Lord, I, I've had a lot of things, Brother Leonard, as you well know, that that's happened in my family. I've had problems, me and my wife have had things that have happened in the family that, honest before God, I don't... I hope nobody else ever has to go through it. But also know that the Lord 
said he'd never leave us nor forsake us. And the one thing that I have found that I know for sure is the fact that I didn't have to go through anything by myself. Amen. And it's not because of the brethren, it's not because of those that I pastor, but it's because the Lord has promised He'd never leave me and have forsake me. Amen. I thought, Lord, what have I got to rejoice in? Now, I want to give you five things real hurriedly this morning, and I'll get out of the way. Number one, we can rejoice in God's salvation. Luke chapter 10, verse number 20 again, Notwithstanding in this, rejoice not that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your name are written in heaven. I'm glad this morning that my name has been written down in the Lamb's book of life, and there is not anything or anyone that can take it out. I'm as sure for heaven as if I'm already there. Matter of fact, we are. Amen. We're seated with him in heavenly places. Psalms chapter number 35 and verse number 9. And my soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall, I like that, it shall rejoice in his salvation. Amen. Now, did you, did you get what I said? Yeah. He said, I'll rejoice in his salvation. Yeah. David said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. You say, what are you saying, preacher? It ain't my salvation. It ain't your salvation. It is his salvation. And he has so graciously bestowed that upon us. He has shared that with us. And we are saved in his salvation. The reason we can rejoice in it is because it's his and not ours. If it was ours, we'd put it up somewhere and forget where we laid it. I don't know about you, but I'm getting a little older now. I'm almost as old as Brother Leonard. And I put things up. My wife, I hope, don't hear this. Because she'd say I was lying. But when I put things up, let me put it that way. When I put things up, I put it up, and then I go to find it, and I say, now, where did I put that? Where did I lay that? My wife said, put it up and write it down so we can get by. I said, we still can't find it because I can't remember where I wrote it down. No need to write it down. We can forget that. I mean, Listen. It is his salvation. If it's ours, we'd do something and forget what we've done with it. But we can rejoice because it is his salvation, not ours. We can rejoice because it's his salvation that is keeping us. He's keeping it and therefore is keeping us. I like that. I don't know about you, but I'm glad he's doing the saving. He's doing the keeping, and he's doing the coming back to get us. We can rejoice in his salvation. Number two, we can rejoice in God's sovereignty. Now, that word scares about every Baptist I know to death. It tires folk up. But I, if God's not in charge, then who is? That's all that that word means is God is in charge. And if he's not in charge, we in trouble. First Chronicles chapter 16, verse number 31. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth, there's that word, rejoice. And let men say among the nations, the Lord reigneth. What's that mean, David? That means he's in charge. He's the one that's doing it. Washington, whether you understand this or not, is not in charge. The Democrats ain't, and the Republicans ain't, and the Independents ain't. All these other nations ain't. God is in charge. In Genesis 1-1, God was in charge. And all through the Word of God, He has been in charge. 
And this day, God's in charge. Come on, folks. You need to, if you can't say amen, at least smile. I mean, I'm looking at some of you and your, your, your lip looking like a D6 pushing up a big pile of dirt. <laughs> Smile this morning. Hey, the one sitting beside of you ain't in charge. God's in charge of all that's taking place. We say, preacher, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I do. God's in charge. Amen. Amen. If I didn't believe that, I'd have never made it through some of the problems and troubles I've gone through. If God wasn't in charge, you wouldn't make it. If God wasn't in charge, I wouldn't make it. But because He is in charge, we are going to make it. Oh, the Lord sets up the kings and He takes them down. I'm glad we can rejoice in the sovereignty of God. Smile. He's in charge. Number three, rejoice in God's sympathy or His mercy. Think about that just a minute. Rejoice in His sympathy or the mercy of God. I look back over my life, Brother Leonard, and think about the times that the mercy of God showed up. I didn't get what I deserved. But I got the mercy of God. I heard a fellow one time. We was in a courthouse. And it ain't none of your business what I was there for. <laughs> some people drive fast, amen, and some people don't drive fast enough. But that fellow was in front of me, and he said, he said, all I want is justice. I said, unto God, I don't. I don't. I mean, I knew I was speeding, amen. I knew I was wrong. But he said, all I want is justice. I said, no, no. All I want is mercy. Great God, when I call out on the Lord, all I can do is cry out and say, God, here I am before you again. I'm not asking for justice, but God, I'm begging you that your mercy would show up again. God, help me. Give me that mercy that only comes from you. I need it today. Oh, it's that mercy of God is something that we can rejoice over. It wouldn't hurt some of you to cut loose and rejoice this morning. If you'll take just a second and think about the mercy of God and how it's been in your life and how God's blessed you with His mercy and taken care of you and been there every step of the way for you and given you all that you need, you, you could probably rejoice a little bit. We ought to be exceedingly glad for the things God has done for us. Number, number four, <laughs> we ought to be able to rejoice over God's safety. How many times has God hit us? I heard an old preacher say one time, you're in one of three places, you're either in a storm coming out of a storm or going into another one. There's been times that God has hid us from the storm. There's been times that God has stopped the storm. And there's been times that we didn't even know there was a storm going on. Because God had put us in that safe place with Him hit us where that the storm could not get to us. Man, I thought about that and I thought about Noah, how that he brought him and put him on that ark and shut that door. The Bible says that it was pitched within and without. 
That means that that atonement had been made on the inside and on the outside. I'm glad that as a child of God, that God saved me in here, but He saved me out here too. He washed the inside and the outside. We can rejoice over God's safety. Psalm chapter 5, verse number 11. But let all those that put their trust in thee rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy, because thou defendest them. Let them also that love thy name, look here, be joyful in thee. What are you saying, preacher? We ought to rejoice over the safety of God. They ain't no other place where you'll be safe like you are in the arms of God. I'm glad that he gathers us in, Brother Leonard, as a hen doth her chicks. Spread that wing out and let us get in close. Put his arm around us and draw us up close to him. Devil comes around and can't get to us because we're comforted. We're, we're placed in that place of safety in the, in the wings of God and we're taken care of there. God's defending us. I'm glad that he stands in our stead. Oh, when we would, when we would deserve the justice of God, I'm glad that we can rejoice instead in the fact that we're safe. Because Jesus Christ is sitting at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for you and me. <laughs> rejoice. Again, I say rejoice. Oh, we ought to lift up our heads and rejoice. Because our redemption is all nigh. Number five, and I'm done. We need to rejoice in our soon wedding service that's coming. Revelation 19, 7. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath been made ready. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be part of the bride of Christ. Amen. We're going to a wedding one day. We get to be in it. I remember some years ago, Brother Leonard, there was another man doing a wedding and they asked me just to play a couple of songs back there on the PA system and I, I, I did that for him. But I was sitting there and as she started coming through the door, I looked over and saw that lovely young girl as she began to walk down the aisle. And I got to think of, man, it ain't going to be long. It ain't going to be long before we, as God's youngins, are going to be coming down the aisle to meet the one up here that we're going to spend eternity with. Man, I got to thinking about that, and before I knew it, I didn't know it. I was shouting and praising God for that bride, and people... When I come to myself, people look at me like, man, you have lost your ever-loving mind. And I thought, you're right. I'm glad that there's coming a day, Brother Curtis. <laughs> when all this is going to be over, there won't be nobody have to stay home from Jubilee because they're sick. There won't be nobody out of the hospital because they've got some kind of disease that's raging in their body. But we'll be with the Lord. All that stuff is gone. Somebody asked me, they said, Preacher, what's the first thing you want to say to your son? When you get to heaven, I know what he'll say to me. It's about time. <laughs> I said, I love my boy. 
I do. And I want to see him. I mean, if he ain't the first thing I got to see. Oh, I want to see the one that's made it possible. And rejoice. Listen. They said, David, when you get to heaven, why the Lord took your son, he said, you can ask him. I said, when I get to heaven, it ain't going to matter, praise God. All that, all that stuff is just that. It's just stuff. It don't matter no more, Brother Leonard. Listen, we've got something to rejoice over this morning. Rejoice. And again, I say, rejoice. Amen. I think I'll give you five pretty good reasons to rejoice Amen. this morning. Amen. Yes, sir, preacher. Father, Amen. I ask you, God, that you'd take this message. Bless you. Lord, use it for your honor and God for your glory. Have your way in the furtherance of the day. And we'll give you the glory for what you do in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, preacher. I appreciate Brother David and uh, the heartache and the hurt that his family has gone through and the loss of his son. Uh, there are no words and there's no, even in our vocabulary, to understand why God would take such a promising young preacher with so much ahead of him. You see, God's ways are not our ways. I was just with a pastor in Alabama last week, and uh, this pastor, Brother Derek Farr, his son was his assistant pastor, and they lost their son in an automobile accident about a year ago. And the pain was still so real for this preacher in this church that my heart ached for them. Uh, there, there's no way, you, you, there's, you can't, rationalize but as brother David said God is in charge you say well if he's in charge why does he let stuff like that happen it's kind of like what the preacher priest last night even in the bad things God may not cause them but he allows them he allows them for purpose in our life for you know I don't know what the purpose is and I I know this God has used brother David in his testimony and God has used brother David and the strength he's shown through all this to encourage others brother Joe Bryant preached last night talked about that when when you're at the bottom that the everlasting arms of God is underneath you he said God's ever before you he's behind you but when you have hit rock bottom his arms his arms are underneath you and I don't, I don't know about you, but that encourages me uh, to know that at your lowest point, what kind of God would he be if he bailed out on us at our low points? Now, sometimes we feel as though he has. We can't find him. We can't feel him. And sometimes we feel like we're all alone. But I'm going to tell you something right now. You'll find in the darkest days of your life when you can't find him, if you just keep looking, you look around, you'll find that he's a faithful friend. I wrote a song years ago about that at a place I couldn't find him that night at 3 o'clock in the morning in a motel room. Didn't feel like I could lift my head up to see the light of another day. Trying to pray and couldn't pray. All of a sudden just started writing some words. When the hurt goes deeper, in the deepest place your heart has ever known. I hope you never experienced that. But if you do, I'm glad that in the midst of all of our disappointments, just look around and we'll find a faithful friend. I appreciate that preaching today from Brother David. I want to ask, Brother Ernie, would you come and sing? I'm not going to ask Miss Deb. I know she's having some throat issues this morning. That song you sang last night that the brother wanted you to sing at his funeral, and I, I just feel like maybe the Lord wants you to sing that this morning. And I appreciate Brother Ernie Peters and Miss Deb. Man, they're just the kind of people that come in a meeting and said, Preacher, whatever you need me to do, 
wherever I can be used to be, help lighten your load, I'm here, and I'm glad for them today. And, and uh, you, you may want to tell a little bit of the testimony. Not everybody was here last night, Brother Ernie. I, uh, gentlemen at our home church, uh, 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 eat up with Asian Orange from Vietnam. And uh, he was, uh, I, I'd use Brother Chris Van Oy. He was a very stalwart man, but uh, Vietnam just did him in. He was wounded and in Agent Orange. And by the time I got to know him, he was very slim and cancer had done his thing. And Brother David, he come to me one Sunday and said, I want you to sing these two songs at my funeral. And I had never heard either one of them. And he said, by the way, you might ought to sing them. Let me hear them, see if you do a good enough job. So I got to sing this song uh, at church one Sunday. And uh, uh, it gets sweeter to me all the time. And, and Brother Jamie, uh, he is, I don't see him, but his kids, uh, last night I looked and I thought, yeah, how he must be blessed to hear the sound of those kids. When I see the sunrise in the morning When I feel the wind blow across my face When I sounds of children play I know it's all part of God's amazing grace and I believe there's a place called heaven and I believe If I didn't, and I believe in a place called Calvary. I believe in a man whose name is Jesus, and I believe that He gave His life. Leonard, can I sing this one more song? Help yourself. Help yeah. yourself, son. You obey uh, the Lord. Yeah. Help yourself. I'll, uh, I'll do this for Brother David. And uh, 
I don't, I've not sung this song because I recorded it, but I can't remember the words, so I have to cheat. I looked up above my phone. And I told Deb when I recorded this, Miss Isla, I said, Deb, it'll be hard for me to, to sing this. And uh, Deb and I, Christmas will be 53 years that we've been married. Yeah. And the Lord didn't bless us with children. It's just been us. Yeah. And one of these days, it's going to be just us. One of us. And I can't even read that. If I leave this world of sorrow Sometime before you do Just look for me in heaven And we'll talk the ages through. But if at first you fail to see me, let me tell you where I'll I'll be thanking Christ, my Savior, for saving a wretch like me. But if you should reach that sea,
endless ages Look for me at Jesus Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. I like it. I love it. I like it when the Lord blesses us and get them tears are flowing on a Monday morning. We ain't crying because we're sad. <laughs> Hallelujah. Heaven's just as real as what we're looking at here today. We've just never seen it with our eyes. But praise God, one day we will. I appreciate my, we've had a lot of folks slipped in on us today. A good crowd on a Monday morning. I'm telling you what, the Lord is, uh, folks are hungry. They're hungry in these days. Amen. Brother Wayne Stafford, I want you to come. Brother Wayne, pastors Pilgrim's Way Baptist Church. Is that right? Is that the name you got it right? They're in Rutherfordton, isn't that? Is that right? Rutherford. I can't say that name. Uh, I know the Rogers family's from down that way. And why they had the name that town, something you can't pronounce, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I always get tongue-tied. Sound like I'm talking in tongues, trying to tell them I'm going to Rutherfordton. And so... Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful little town down there. I've, I've preached down in that area some. I, they finally found me, and I finally found them uh, a couple of years ago. And I appreciate Brother Wayne, and he might tell you he, he's got a good ministry out of his church uh, that they do there, and he might tell you a little bit about that. Brother, preach, you come bring our second message for us today. Amen. God bless you. Amen. for the privilege to be uh, here this morning, amen. And I ain't the only one from Rolfton, Miss Kim, Brother Sammy, praise God, good to see some Rolftonites, amen, Rolftonites, amen, Rutman, no, I didn't say Rutmanites, amen, Rolftonites, amen. I don't say Rutherfordton either, I just say Rolfton. I live in Rolfton, amen. I know, I know. Rolfton, amen. Rolfton, Rolfton, amen. Amen. The Lord is certainly good, isn't he? Amen. And boy, I appreciate the Lord being faithful uh, down through these years. And I appreciate a bunch of Tennesseans coming out on a Monday morning after that defeat on Saturday. Man, it was rough, amen. I know, I know. I got to sit down now. I, uh, I started to ask Brother Montgomery where his arms tied, and he went and got that. Amen. I appreciate. Amen. I, I was pulling for him, Brother Leonard. I was. I honestly was. Amen. 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 I appreciate the Lord. He's good, ain't he? And um, I, I'm grateful. Amen. My hope's not up there. My hope's not in Chapel Hill. My hope's not in Dallas. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a diehard cowboy fan. I'm a, I'm a diehard type. Hey, but my stuff is, hey, I'm with him. I'm with him, amen. Uh, but uh, I'm glad my hope's not in none of that stuff. My hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I'm, I'm glad I've been to Calvary too, hallelujah. March 30th, 1997, hallelujah. Jesus passed by my way one morning. Thank God, hair on my back, earrings in my ear. Recovering from a Garth Brooks concert the night before. But God. But God, hallelujah. Amen. Made my way out to the house of God on that Sunday morning. My pastor, 25 years, let a young preacher preach on that Monday, on that Sunday morning. He he preached hell hot and heaven sweet. Boy, God hung me out over hell that morning. Said it's now or never. Amen. And boy, I appreciate what the Lord did for me. Saved me. Changed my life. Hey, hey, all things are passed away and all things 
have become new. Put a love in my heart. I'm telling you what. I'm telling you, hey, only God could do what he done for me. I know where I was when he found me. Amen. I know where I was. Amen. I knew the pit. I knew the dung hill. He pulled me out of. Amen. And I bless his holy name for that this morning. It is good to be in the Lord's house today. Matthew chapter number 15. Matthew chapter number 15. And um, I'll give you what the Lord's put on my heart this morning. And um, I do appreciate uh, uh, the privilege to be here. I love Brother Fletcher. I told my people I, it was an honor to be able to come to this meeting last year. It was the first time I've ever been on these grounds. And boy, God helped my heart Amen. last year. And I went home rejoicing. Amen. In the things of God. Amen. And I, I appreciate your pastor. I appreciate Brother Fletcher and, and what he means to me. I, I've, I've never heard him and, and it leave me uh, disappointed. Never heard him and leave me scratching my head wondering whose side I was on and where I was and what I needed from God. Amen. And I like a preacher like that. Amen. Hey, thank God. If you got to leave here shaking your head after I get done preaching, I, I didn't mean to leave you that way. Amen. I want it to be plain. I want to put the cookies on the lower shelf so everybody can get them. Amen. I'm not a, 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 a man, a great theologian. I just know what God did for me this morning. I'm a simple man, amen. I, hey, thank God this morning. I bless his name. Good to be saved. Good to be in the house of God, amen. If you're able, let's stand, amen. We honor the reverence reading God's word. Uh, we do got a men's home for men getting out of prison. And uh, this morning, uh, I've got to Brother Scott with me uh, this morning. He's one of our men uh, that came out of our home. He lived with me uh, for a year in our men's home. Uh, we've got a men's home for men getting out of prison Amen. and uh, men who getting out of jail, long-term jail sentences uh, who have nowhere to go, nowhere to call home and uh, nobody to turn back to. And the uh, Lord put in my heart one, one Friday night I was preaching in a prison revival. Been in prison meetings and jails for 15 years now at least or more and going into those cell blocks. Mm. I used to put them in jail. I've got a four-year degree in criminal justice from Western Carolina University. Got a uh, basic law enforcement training. Got out and got was a, a police for several years. And God started dealing my heart to preach. I seen just a little effect I was having wearing the uniform. I thought there's something bigger God wanted me to do. And he was calling me to preach. I surrendered to preach 20 years ago next week. Amen. But three years ago, well, four years ago now, 2018, the Lord put in my heart after a prison revival one night to start a home for a man, uh, for men getting out of prison. I had a man come up to me after the service, weeping on Friday night. He said, Preacher, pray for me. I'm scared. And I sized him up. I said, You? Scared of what? He said, I'm scared of out there. He said, I have no wife have no children, have no license, have no car, I have no home, I have no money. And he said, this is all I've known. He said, they're going to put me on a bus and ship me to Asheville to a homeless shelter. He said, preacher, it won't be long, I'll be back here. Please pray for me. And boy, the God of heaven got in the truck with me that night yeah. on the way home. Yeah. And boy, I wallered and wallered and wallered them covers and them sheets. That Sunday morning, I went to the church. Boy, I was still bothered about what that man said. And I told the church, I said, we're going to have to do something. We didn't have no money. We just knew work ourselves. And, uh, I mean, just got, got a lot of missionaries just, just trying our best to make it. I said, well, God wants us to do something. We can do something, can't we? God began to work in our people's hearts. And... Uh, Long story short, we've been in operation for four years now, Amen. helping men getting out of prison. Amen. I'm not pushing 500 through to say we've done it. But there's one here this morning that I say we, we're successful. Amen. And his name's Scott. Scott, raise your hand, buddy. We're working on more. He is now, after living with me in my home for a year, he went out on his own, working at the job that I got him, driving the car we bought him, with the license that we helped him get back after 12 long years 
of not having no driver's license. And now he is the director of the home. I called him and said, Can you, would, you, would you be willing to quit that job that I got you? He said, what, preacher? I said, yeah, quit the job that I got you that you're faithful at. He said, to do what, preacher? I said, to come work for me now. And he started crying. He said, really? I said, really? And he's here this morning as the director of the home. And Kyle, the one in the white shirt right there, he's 19 years old. He's came to our home about a month ago. He's from Jamestown, Tennessee. Family's in a mess. You don't have mama don't have no relationship with him. Daddy, brothers. He had a he had a pastor, a preacher friend. Put him in the van. I've never met him. Heard about our home in a meeting somewhere, Brother Davy. Come pulling in our driveway in the church bus and dropped him off from Tennessee. I said, How'd you get here, son? Somebody cared enough. About, to, about him to bring him to our place. And he's been with us about two months now. And I asked him yesterday, I said, you want to go with us to Tennessee? Really? Yeah, I'd love to. Here he is today, 19 years old. That's our burden. That's our home. We're not government funded. We're funded by people of like faith, of churches. I don't pay Scott hardly nowhere near what he's worth but I help him I love on him we're debt free God we bought a place for ninety thousand dollars paid it off in three years because of God's people God that we didn't our church didn't we didn't have we don't have it but God's people and we're still supporting today by God's people like you pray for the men song the pilgrims pathway house of refuge Psalm 9 9 says, The Lord also is a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble. Ain't you glad of that today? Ain't you glad of that today? He's a refuge in the time of trouble. This morning, all I want to do is help you. I want to be a blessing to you. All that's in my heart is to help people. I'm going to tell them the truth. I preached Tuesday at the jail, 16 got saved. 16. Did y'all hear that? I don't believe in pray after me, repeat one, two, three. There was 90-something in there. 16 of them got saved. Amen. We preached to them. We don't sugarcoat to those men. You know what them men need? Truth. They've been lied to their whole lives. Misled. They need truth. Hear me today. If we'll just stand for truth and do it in love. God will take it and use it for the glory of God. I tell you this, I preached Tuesday morning, one of them boys got saved. Yesterday, he got out of jail. Last night, he was at the Pilgrim's Way Baptist Church. He stayed in my home last night. I said, Preacher, you interested in, that, in them kind of folk? Count me in. Here's why I'm interested in them kind of folk. Jesus was. Matthew 15. Verse 21. Then Jesus went thence and departed, in verse number 21, unto the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the, of the same coast cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, Truth, 
Lord. Yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that hour. Father, thank you for the word of God. Help us this morning to preach your word. Thank you, God, for what we feel in our soul. Thank you, God, for the help, God, we've received already. Father, it's in our heart this morning. We'd be a help and a blessing uh, to your people. Father, I pray you'd touch us and use us for your namesake and for your glory. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated this morning. I just want to preach this morning on, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. Help me, amen. Hey, they ain't a man, woman, boy, and a girl, amen, ever needed help that our God did not able to help them and is not able to help them, amen. Well, I appreciate, amen, the times uh, that I've received help from the Lord, amen. I'm telling you what, I, hey, you're looking at a wretched mess up in here this morning. I, hey, thank God, outside of the grace of God uh, and the help of God, uh, hey, listen, thank God this morning, uh, hey, you'd not want to hear from me. Uh, you'd not want to hear one word I got to say, but oh my, hallelujah, oh, thank God for the morning I came to where he was uh, and cried out for help and cried out for mercy and the Lord heard me amen and he changed my life and he changed and he put something in me amen worth sharing hallelujah and it's all because of a man by the name of Jesus amen here we have the story amen of this woman oh my I mean Jesus is uh, uh, going through a, a lot of things here in this chapter I mean he's having to deal amen with that spiritual crowd that religious crowd Oh my! And he, 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 they're, they're fussing and, and raising a fit about uh, them not washing their hands before they eat. Amen. Jesus goes on to rebuke that crowd. Uh, he said, that "With their lips they do honor me." He said, "But the, uh, with their heart is far from." It. And God calls that religious crowd uh, a bunch of hypocrites. Amen, a bunch of hypocrites, amen. Hey, listen, he goes on to tell them, he said, it's not what, amen, what you put in your mouth that defiles you, but it's what comes out of a mouth. Hey, what comes out of your mouth that defiles a man. And so he's dealing with that crowd. And the Bible says, amen, and Jesus went thence. In other words, he said, I ain't got time to fool with them. Amen. His disciples came and they said, Did you not know that this crowd, our Lord, was uh, uh, offended at your saying? You know, we're living in a day where everybody's offended, ain't we? Huh? I mean, boy, everybody in the world's offended. I wonder what our God, amen. I wonder what our God thinks about what we're doing in these days, amen. I wonder this morning, amen, when we can go on a, a television and provoke this crowd and that crowd and provoke this, uh, amen, way of living, this lifestyle, amen. And boy, and, and, and not to upset anybody or exclude anybody. Oh my, listen, we're careful not accept the, uh, to accept to, uh, 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 hurt this crowd or hurt this one's feelings. Uh, and all the while, we're not even worried about what God's thinking this morning. What is God offended at? I wonder, is God offended? What, what's going on in America this morning? I'd say that he is, amen. God help us, amen. We're in a mess, amen. We're in a mess this morning, amen. Oh, but thank God, God, uh, amen, God this morning, uh, hallelujah, he specializes uh, in making miracles out of messes, amen. Oh, look what he does. Uh, he goes on. The Bible said he departed. In other words, he said this, I ain't got time to fool y'all. If y'all too worried about this, hey man, and not worried about this, hey, I ain't got time to mess with you, amen. Oh, oh my, may the Lord help us, amen. And so listen now, the Bible says he goes on, so he goes up the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And the Bible says he came to a woman of Canaan. Oh, listen now. Oh, thank God she knows things about this woman. Notice her problem. The Bible says this. He says, and she cries out unto him, Lord, have mercy on me. O oh Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. Watch this now. But he answered her, not a word. I mean, not, not a word. Have you ever asked, Lord, help me? And it seems as if the Lord's not answering you. 
Have you ever been there where it seems if you got down and prayed and, and you look up, Brother David, and the walls were of iron and one of the ceilings were of brass and you just hadn't got no, you just feel like you weren't getting anywhere with God. I've been there this morning. I've been there when there seemed there was no word from God. Amen. Just because, amen, there's no word for God. Listen now, word from God don't mean he ain't listening. We want to put God on our terms. Amen. But may I remind you, God's not on our terms. Hey, if we're going to get anything from God, we're going to get anywhere with God, we're going to have to get on His terms, amen. His ways are not our ways. Our thoughts are not His thoughts, amen. Hey, just because He's not answered yet don't mean He ain't listening, amen. Her problem this morning, her problem, she's got, a, she's got some problems going on. First of all, from her descent, she's a Gentile. She's an old dog. Uh, I mean, this woman just got told she is a dog. If anybody had the right to get offended and run away, it'd probably be her. I mean, hello, you get up and preach, you're done but a bunch of dogs, amen. They're going to start popping up and walking out, amen. I know I've been there, amen. I mean, Jesus, amen. Amen. She's got some problems for her to sin. She ain't even supposed to, amen. Ain't she glad God said, I'm going to go through there. I'm going to go through Tyre and Sidon. I'm going to go through Samaria. Amen. I'm going to go. Oh, hallelujah. Amen, church. Listen, with her to sin, she's got a problem not with her to sin, but with her daughter. The Bible says her daughter grievously vexed with the devil. Her daughter's in a mess. Well, have we got any families out there today that's in a mess? We got any children in a mess? We got any daughters or sons in a mess? Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but it's eating my family up. I mean, everywhere I turn, my family's in a mess. They're in a mess. They're in a mess. Amen. My extended family, Brother David, I'm telling you what, they're in a mess. Amen. My help, may the Lord help us today. She's got some problems, amen. Her, amen. Then she's got some problems with the disciples. Now watch this now. The disciples seemingly were not interested in this woman. I wonder is the church interested in that crowd that don't look like us. I know, I know. You know when I went by yesterday, I went by that complex up on that hill with all them lights on it last night. Tennessee something. Northeast Correctional. And brother, they, uh, bro, brother Leonard, there was something in my heart wanting to get out and go preach to that crowd. I'm telling you, amen. I'd have preached outside the fence, amen, if I wouldn't have got shot, amen. I'm interested. Are we interested anymore? And that crowd that don't look like us, don't smell like us, maybe got a tattoo somewhere, maybe got a hole punched somewhere. Are we interested, amen, in no crowd anymore? Are we just interested in getting other people from other churches, amen? Transplant, amen. What about being reproductive? Like the Bible said, go on the highways and hedges and compel them to come that my house may be full, amen. Hey, I'm not interested in transplants, amen. I'm interested in that crowd, amen, that's lost, amen, without God, and never heard of Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, we've got them in our day that's never even heard the word Jesus anymore. And they're not in Sudan either. They're right here in the hills of Tennessee and the western North Carolina. Hey, we're in a mess, amen. Hey, they, the disciples said, send her away. Get her out of here, Lord. She don't look like us. She don't, amen, she's got some problems. But notice her place. She said, Lord, have mercy. On me, thou son of David. She recognized him for who he was. You know what she, you know, hey man, you know what the son of David, that put him in his rightful place as the Messiah. The Jew, amen. Hey man, David's lineage. A hey, Jew, hey man, even though she was an outcast, she said, You're the Messiah. You're, hey man, you're God. Hey, you're the one, hey amen. Oh, hallelujah. Hey, her, please have mercy. Boy, that's what we need to cry. Have mercy. But then don't you notice know, her persistency? Hey amen. The Bible says this. Hey amen. But he answered her not a word. Just keep praying. Hey amen. And the disciples said, Come and send her away. But he answered and said, I'm not sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But then she came. Then she came. Look, then she came. After she's heard all this, she's heard all the negativity, but she came anyway. 
she came anyway. Oh my, hallelujah. Look at the persistency, amen, of this woman, amen. Well, I'm glad, thank God, if you'll just go after God, if you'll just draw the eye to God, God will draw an eye to you. If you make one step toward God, God will make a step towards you, amen. Listen, church, it don't matter if the crowd, amen, or the church, or anybody else don't want you. Thank God if you move toward God, God wants you, amen. Hey, her persistent, she stayed persistent, then she came. Notice her praise. The Bible says she didn't come. Hey, man, just cause everybody else is coming. She came and worshiped. She came with one purpose. She said, whether or not you're going to heal my daughter or not, I'm just going to come worship you for who you are. Hey, man, she said, thou son of David, have mercy on me. She knew exactly what she was. She had heard the story. She had got saved. Somehow or another, she had put her faith in this one called Christ. Oh, happy day. Thank God, church. When we, hey, man, just come, hey, man, to worship him in spite of the mess, in spite of the problems, in spite of the heartaches, in spite of the difficulties, we'll just come worship God anyway. Amen. amen. She praised him. Amen. And then she said a prayer. Look what she said. Help me. Lord, I mean you're in good shape when you start calling him Lord. Are y'all listening this morning? Lord, help me. You know what I cried that morning? I really don't know. But I'm for sure it's help me. Somewhere in that hour of prayer, 30 minutes of prayer, I, I don't know, I've got it on cassette tape, amen, the service, amen, where we came to the altar that morning, and I, all I can hear, Brother Curtis, is a bunch of people praying. I don't know what all I said, but I believe the Lord saved me when I stepped out of that pew back yonder and made my way to God, amen. I got down here and began to pray, and Lord, help me. I'm in a mess, amen. I'm in a mess, amen. And you know what the Lord did? He helped me. He helped me. You know what you'll do? If you'll cry, Lord, help me. If you'll get some Lord, if you'll get to the Lord this week and say, Lord, I need some help. I've got a daughter. I've got a son. I've got a problem. I've got a pain. I've got this. I've got that. Lord, I need some help, amen. He can help you, amen. I've been pastoring 16 years where I'm at, going on 17 in June. I've gone, I've gone a lot, I've gone through a lot of hurt. I know what church hurts like. Hey man, listen, and it hurts. It hurts, it hurts, it hurts. But you know what today? I'm still standing, hallelujah. By the good grace of God, I'm still standing. Oh, thanks be to God. Oh, bless his dear name. Hey, thank God, church, we can make it. We can go on. We can, with the Lord's help, persevere. We can, through the Lord's help, hey, amen, keep being persistent. Keep praying. Keep pleading. Keep going to God. He will help us, amen. Now, I want you to look at this. Look at her prize, hallelujah. She won. She won. The Bible says, hey man. He said, answer, he said, it's not me to take children's bread to cast the dogs. You know what she said? Truth, Lord. What you said is true. I'm just an old dog. But I love what she said. Yet the dogs need to eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Then Jesus. See, if you'll get real about who you really are and about your situation, the Lord willing to get real with you. You see, I told that crowd other day in the jail, I said, you, some of y'all don't want no help. And that's why you ain't going to get no help. But if you'll get real, and if you'll get honest, and cry out for God to help you, God will help you. Amen. I'm glad God's in the business of helping his youngins. Amen. And the Bible says, he called, what's this now? He said, O woman, great is thy faith, be it known even unto the as thou wilt. You know what he said about her? He said, your faith is great. I wonder if the Lord said that about our faith today. Hey, you know what? He, he didn't say that about Moses. He didn't say that about Elijah. He didn't say that about Paul. But he said this about an old Gentile dog. Said her faith was great. He didn't say that about his disciples. Matter of fact, he got on the boat with the disciples and says, where is your faith? How is it that you have no faith? Then he says in another place, oh, you have little faith. To the religious crowd, come on now. But he says to this woman, woman, you're a great faith. You're a woman of great faith. I'm glad this morning there's help to be had. 
from the Lord. Preacher, I'm done. Hey, get help this week. I come for help. I put in a meeting. We have Jubilee too. A couple, two weeks from now, we'll be in Jubilee at our place. You know what I want to be, Brother Leonard? Like you want to be. I want to be a help yes, sir. and a blessing Amen. to God's people because we do need help in Amen. these days. Amen. God help us this morning. And I'm glad help's available Amen. and help can be had. Amen. Thank you, preacher. Amen. Thank you, preacher. That's wonderful. I appreciate the work this man's doing and a worthy work. So if your church is looking for a work to support, uh, that would be a worthy thing to do that uh, today. I appreciate all of you being here. Some slipped in while we're having services today. I'll tell you what let's do. Let's stand to our feet. I want to give you just about five minutes to fellowship, refresh yourself. If you need to go to the restroom, need to get a drink, and we'll be coming back in. We've got two more preachers we want to preach today. So just enjoy yourself, fellowship for just a few minutes. We'll get started back.
All right, let's get gathered around. Let's get started back. And uh, we'll have plenty of time at lunch to fellowship. And so everybody gather back around. We'll get started and uh, try to get back in gear. Amen. I appreciate what the Lord's already done. He's been good to us, praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Sister Isla, I want you to be making your way to the platform. She's going to do a song for us to get started off in our second uh, section of the meeting this morning. And uh, she's uh, going to come and do a song for us. Sister Isla, she, she sang her and Brother Melvin and their daughter sang yesterday morning for us. And my, what a treat that was. And we're so glad to have her. And I know Brother Gary's probably got her queued up on what she's going to sing today, and she's going to come, and then we're going to have our next preacher, Brother Chuck Stout, is going to come and preach for us today, and I know he'll be a blessing to you. So you pray for Sister Isla. She come does a song for us today. Well, I hope you'll pray hard. It's hard to follow. Uh, Ernie, I'm telling you, they should have let me go first. But uh, I was thinking this morning, it's been... Uh, I was a young woman when I first came to Dyson Grove. I was about 66 or 67. We were down in the old church. And I'm, I'm going to be 80, my birthday. And I was thinking how good the Lord has been. And I sang this song, and I'm pretty sure, preacher, it was down in a little church, and there was a little preacher that got up, and he got, got going around in a circle, and you couldn't stop him. And I praise the Lord, and I may be too old to sing it, but I sure like to try it. I wrote it about 2001, I think. So, uh, brother, let's see if we got the right one. I think that it's number 12. If it's not, we'll sing whatever he plays. <laughs> one of these days, I'm going to get up. Well, this old body that I wear is just a piece of clay. Earth to earth, dust to dust, it shall return someday. But don't give up, it's not the end. God's gonna put it together again. I'm gonna get up out of that clay when he calls my name. Well, don't get up. Again, when the trumpet sounds, gonna get up, I'm gonna get up out of that grave when he comes again. Boy, you better believe I'm looking forward to that day in a brand new body. Well, I am not afraid to face the end. This life, I know the grave is just a place to rest a little while. It's just a place to spend the night before I take my homeward flight. I'm gonna get up out of that grave. Won't it be a sight? Well, I'm gonna get up. When the trumpet sounds, gonna get up out of that grave. Up out of that grave when he comes again. When the trumpet sounds, I'm gonna get up. I'm gonna have a new body, just like the Son of God. Son of God, when he calls me, I'm going to get up out of that grave. 
That'll make you want to get up, won't it? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord, Miss Isla. I'm telling you what, now she still got it, don't she? I appreciate that. I appreciate that song. I'll never forget you singing at that time in the old building down there. We was packed in there like sardines that morning. It was on Tuesday morning. The Preacher's Fellowship was here. And Brother Cecil Sturgill, who's in heaven now. Miss Isla was going down the aisle of singing that. And Brother Sturgill jumped up, grabbed her by the hand, and they done the two-step in the middle of the aisle. And I, it was in the Holy Ghost, too. I'm talking about, that's the first time I'd ever seen it. And I said, Brother Mel, I know there's another man danced with your wife today. But I said the Holy Ghost was all over it, and it, it didn't bother him a bit. And boy, we had a time. That was one of those memorable times in Jubilee. Isn't that amazing how God gives us these times to create memories? And this meeting will end at the end of this week, but boy, we'll take things. I was talking to Brother Mark Fowler back here. Brother Mark pastors down in Elizabeth in Tennessee, and uh, his church has been so good to help us in this meeting. And he, he came, he told me, he said, I don't know hardly any preacher here. I said, hang around long enough, you'll get to know all of them. And I'm going to tell you something. God's just brought a lot of people together here. Been a blessing, amen. Brother Chuck Stout, I want you to come. I've got bro him and Brother Ponder going to take us up to lunch. I don't even know what time it is, but we're going to try to uh, get them in. And I, I appreciate Brother Chuck Stout. Been my friend for many, many years. Uh, from the time he's just a young preacher, and now God's using him greatly at the Valley View Baptist Church over there. Matter of fact, I took him over there in revival meeting with him. That's before the older man of God that was over there stepped aside over there, and I said, Chuck, you need to go with me. And I told him as we was walking down the sidewalk, I said, you need to preach at this church. And I believed that with all my heart, and I introduced him to the old man of God that was there, Brother Roger Lee Frost. And it wasn't too many more years later that Brother Frost uh, stepped aside, and I had a feeling that they had this boy on speed dial, and that God's knit their heart together. Brother Chuck, you obey the Lord today. Amen. Amen. That Sunday night uh, that Brother Frost resigned, I'll say this real quick. You can turn your Bibles to Matthew chapter 1, if you will, and I'll tell you this. That Sunday evening, uh, I was preaching at another church. They'd been, as a matter of fact, that church, they'd been asking me to come pastor there. And uh, that Sunday morning, I preached, and then I had a phone call from Bristol young girl, her husband's in the hospital and uh, needed to get back to see him and uh, <clears throat> one of the men at the church there at Heritage Baptist Church said um, if you need to go back to Bristol we'll get somebody else to fill in for that Sunday night <clears throat> where I was scheduled to preach both services and I said well let me go pray about it went down the basement their fellowship halls there in the basement where Travis Price had pastored for years I got down the basement praying, and the Lord said, uh, yeah, you need to go on back to Bristol. And he said, now, when you're done preaching this morning, you tell them this is the very last time you'll preach at Heritage Baptist Church. So I thought, all right. And I went up the steps, and I, I thought, and I just my conversation in my head with the Lord, I said, Lord, you mean the very last time, or you mean? He said, this is the last time you'll ever preach at Heritage Baptist Church. I said, Okay. And I, I, I'm just dumb enough to believe God sometimes. And went home at the hospital, went back to my house that evening and was getting dressed to go to my home church to hear my pastor preach. And uh, got a text from one of the ladies, Sister Geraldine Bensel. Y'all that had been around Jubilee for a long time, Miss Geraldine and Brother Ted used to come over and Ted cooked eggs every morning for years. And uh, anyway, Miss Geraldine sent me a message and said, Brother Frost is resign the church y'all pray for us and I sent her a message back and I said will you uh, you give the deacons my phone number and tell them if I can ever help them you know let me know and uh, I sent her that message and walked about 15 feet up my basement steps and just as I went to open the door to walk into the into the kitchen where my wife was standing and God said to me that's where I'm going to put you and I stopped stood on my top step in my basement and just before I opened that door. And I said, Lord, you going to put me at Valley View? And the Lord said, that's where I'm going to put you. 
And I said, okay. I walked out, walked around the kitchen. I looked at Tammy, told her basically what I just told you. And I said, God's going to send me up there. Oh, that's good. You preach in revival. Do you know them? You can help them. I said, no. That's where I'm going to be when Jesus comes. You say, preacher, are you sure of that? I'm as sure as that today as you're sitting where you're sitting. I mean, it's, a, it's a joyous time in your life when you know that you're standing in the perfect, perfect center of the will of God. And I'm thankful for that day. Matthew chapter 1. I don't even ask you to stand this morning. Uh, I'm going to be quick and get out of the way. I'm, I'm excited to hear Brother Curtis. He's preaching just down the road from my house next week. I thought I was going to have to wait till then. Chapter 1, verse 1 says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Phares and Zarah of Thamar, and Phares begat Ezram, and Ezram begat Aram. And Aram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Salmon. And Salmon begat Boaz of Rechab, and Boaz begat Obed, and of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David the king, and David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Uriah. So you pray with me today, if you will. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity. God, you know what's in my heart. Lord, the calling you placed on my life, I give myself into your hands one more time. Now you clothe me. You use me in a way that will glorify you and will help your people. Thank you for the preaching we've already heard and how it's helped my heart and, and just laid right in line with what you've had in my, burning in me for the last few days. Lord, you have your way, and we're going to praise you. We're going to thank you for cause of who you are. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As we read the lineage of Christ there, and I, I, you understand you're going down. I know there's more to it. But just for the sake of time this morning, when you read the lineage of Christ, you find a lot of the heroes of faith you find the men Abraham's called the father of faith, and of course Isaac, then Jacob, later named, uh, changed his name to Israel, the apple of God's eye, God's chosen people. We get on down through there, but I'm interested in verse number 6. Verse number 6, you come to the name of a man by the name of Uriah. We know him as Uriah, Second Samuel chapter number 11, that's where he comes on the scene. 2 Samuel chapter 11, the first time he's mentioned and many times in that chapter, the truth is, better than half the times his name's mentioned in Scripture. It's all in 2, Kings, or 2 Samuel chapter 11. There's the place in Kings and place in Chronicles where he's mentioned. And over half the times his name's mentioned, it's not just Uriah. It's Uriah the Hittite. Uriah the Hittite, and you think, well, the lineage of Christ... We just read the lineage of Christ. We know he's the line of the tribe of Judah. Uh, we know he's the son of David. We know he's the king of kings and lord of lords. Uh, how did Uriah get there? The qu my question today and the whole thought of my heart is, how'd you get here? That preacher just talked about that man getting out of that prison and dri driving him over to the house and he stepped out and he's like, how'd, how'd you get here? I, can I say this just real quickly, and then I'll get to the message. I, that, bless my heart, brother from Ruston uh, was talking about uh, that, that that first convert sitting there in that middle pew, yeah. the first one in that house. It reminded me a lot of my testimony. I was saved at Salt Rock Baptist Church, in 1998, November 1998. Well, the year before that, they had a, it wasn't a prison ministry; it was a preschool ministry. And if you've ever worked with preschoolers, they're about as mean as convicts. <laughs> But in, that, my pre, in the preschool ministry, my pastor, the very first night I met Bill Hawkins, as I walked out of that building, and <laughs> a lot like that preacher, had hair down to my shoulders. I didn't, I didn't have any earrings. I just got out of the Marine Corps, ain't it? And they frowned on that. But, <laughs> but as, I, as I walked out of that building and walked back to my old truck and got in the truck, my wife looked at me and was looking for a place to put our... Our oldest daughter, Caitlin, she's about two and a half years old at the time. Okay, and Tammy looked at me and she goes, this is a good place. They'll take care of her here. And these are my words. I said, I don't want her here. And she said, why? And I said, I don't want her preached to. That was my, that's how hard-hearted I was and how uh, just against the things of the Lord I was. I mean, I just didn't want nothing to do with any of it. 
And my pastor looked at a lady by the name of Pam Smith that was running that preschool at the time and said, he's going to be the first one. So what do you mean? She said, he's going to be the first one saved out of this ministry. A year later, a little over a year later, on November the 15th, the Lord saved me. And about six months later, I got a call, a lot like that brother's call, and said, hey, um, I've been praying about this. Why don't you pray? I believe the Lord's got something for you to do here at the church. That's all he said. And I was working at a steel factory painting bridge parts at the time, and I was down there painting an old bridge one time, a 78-foot girder painting it, and, I, and about halfway down that girder, the Lord said, I'm fixing to put you somewhere. I'm going to let you run that preschool ministry. <laughs> Brother, be encouraged. Let me tell you something. In the next two years, I saw 18 adults saved out of that ministry. Not in a church house. Now, I, I saw men walk through the door broken because their little girl would leave and quoting John 3, 16. And he'd come in, praise God. Can I say, a lot of times, it's not exactly where we are, but how we got there. How did Uriah end up in the lineage of Christ? How did Uriah end up in the place where God Almighty said, one of these days, I'm going to have a little boy named Matthew write a book. And when we put down the ancestry of our Savior and King, I'm going to put your name in the middle of it. You're right. How did he do that? Well, first of all, somehow along the way, he had to find some faith. Uh -huh. For by grace are you saved through faith, and then the, the faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. We know all them verses. Yes. But the fact is, Uriah didn't have a preacher. Uriah didn't have a pastor. He came from a Hittite nation that worshipped false and fake gods. They worshipped every idol. That If a rock fell the right way, they'd worship that rock. The sun came up over a certain tree, they'd worship that tree. You say, preacher, that, you're exaggerating things. Friends, study the Hittites. They worshiped anything and everything. Yeah. And the fact is, they, he didn't have any guidance. He didn't have any strength. But in Deuteronomy chapter number 20, God said, Be thou, uh, But thou shalt utterly destroy them, namely the Hittites. Now this is... Not just how did Uriah get here, yeah. he wasn't even supposed to be here. Right. He wasn't supposed to be anywhere. Yeah. At some point when the, the children of Israel came against the nation of the Hittites, and Uriah was a man of battle, obviously, by his, his, all his history. If you study Uriah, there ain't a lot to study, but what you do study, you'll find a lot. Uriah went into that. He saw this battle and saw the nation of Israel coming in and overtaking and doing the things that God had told him to do. And just for the record, uh, the Hittites were not being destroyed because God's mean. The Hittites were not being destroyed because God's a bigot. The Hittites were being destroyed because of their sin. And the wages of sin still is death. So somewhere along the way, Uriah looked at one of those Israelites, one of those Jews... I said, it's funny, I've prayed to that statue and I've done all that this fellow's told me to do and nothing's happened. Yeah. But I, I heard of a fella. Yeah. I heard of a fella that prayed and asked God for fire to fall from heaven and yeah. it did. Yeah. I, I heard of a man that had preached for a hundred years it was going to rain, nobody had ever seen it before and then all of a sudden, there it comes. And Uriah, somewhere along the way, had heard the truth of the good God of heaven and had enough faith just to trust in him. Yeah. And somehow, and I can't explain why he saved him and why he was one of the Hittites, maybe the only one. I don't know how many of them, uh, other the rest of them survived that. But as far as I can find in the scripture, and, and I, if you find it, you can tell me and I won't be a bit offended about it. As far as I know, Uriah is the only one named Hittite that got out of that. You can say, well, how did it happen? Well, it sounds to me like he got saved. He got saved physically. Amen. He got saved spiritually. Uh -huh. uh, it goes on in, in uh, chapter 11, 2 Samuel. He says to David, as thy soul liveth. Yeah. I'll, not go do, I'll not go against the word of God. Amen. Can I say to you, David, uh, when David uh, found, and we, we, come, we come to the story of Uriah in 2 Samuel chapter 11, we find a man that's not supposed to be there. Right. Then we find a king 
that wasn't supposed to be where he was either. So how did Uriah get into the family of God? He found some faith. What did he find once he got there? How did he act once he got there? You can read about Uriah. You can, you can find all you can about him. The fact of the matter is he was a faithful soldier. He was one that went on and did what God told him to do, even when he didn't understand. And David, you know, David's up there, and you know the story, and just for the sake of time, we'll go quick. David looks out at Bathsheba. He lusts after her. First of all, he's being lazy. He should have been down the battlefield. He was lazy and laid around till noontime or afternoon, whatever, the evening tide. It was at sometime afternoon. He laid around all morning. And then, so he was lazy. Then he lusted after this woman. Then he, then he called for her. And the Bible says, and one answered and said, she, he names uh, her daddy's name. It just left me. But the second thing he says, he said, that's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Now, obviously, Uriah had a testimony of his character because when that man, whoever that unnamed person was in that verse that said, one of them said, that's the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David didn't say who. He knew exactly who he was talking about. I dare say that Uriah probably stood out in the crowd. When he went to join the, nation, the, the army of the nation of Israel and he went to boot camp or whatever they did back then and they fell into formation, I guarantee you some of them went around and said, what's that Hittite doing here? Yeah. Amen. How did he get out of that? Yeah. How did he get over here on this side? Some of them just want to know how they got there. Yeah. Amen. And then all of a sudden, David says, bring, bring him to me. Bring, bring her to me, rather. Bring her to me. She comes. You know the story. Uh, he commits adultery with, with Bathsheba. Then she finds out she's pregnant. And then David says, uh-oh. I, I got to do something to protect my reputation. I've got to do something to cover this mess up. I, I've got to do something. I, I know what. He, he calls that messenger, sends a messenger. He says, go get Joab. When you find Joab, tell him that I want to see Uriah the Hittite. I want to see you ride. Bring him back here. Brings him back. He gets back home. Y'all know the story. He comes in and uh, David says, well, how's the battle going? Yeah. How's Joab? Yeah. You know, just making small talk. You know, just trying to make everything look natural as it could. And then all of a sudden he says, why don't you take ease and go on down to your house and, yeah. and uh, wash your feet and be with your wife yeah. for the evening. Uriah looks around, and I believe he looked at the king with a little bit of disbelief. Yeah. I, I can't believe that you're telling me to go to the house. And then he says, the ark is out there in the battle. Yeah. Joab's out there in the battle. Yeah. The nation of Israel's out there in the battle. How could I go to my house? Yeah. Amen. And the Bible says he made his bed at the, the gate of the palace with the king's servants. Yeah. He wouldn't even go to his house. Much less, and you say, well, why is that, preacher? Well, in Deuteronomy 23, 9, God said, when the host goeth forth against thine enemies, then keep thee from every wicked thing. If there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of uncleanness, that chanceth him by night, then shall he go abroad out of the camp. He shall not come within the camp. Just in plain, simple terms, if, if a man's been with a woman, he ain't fit for battle. That's what that says. And Uriah says, if I go into that house, temptation will overtake me. And I'll end up laying with my wife. And then I won't be fit to do what I've been called to do. He was found, he found a little faith and got in the army of Israel. But once he got in the army of Israel, he was found faithful. I'm talking about a man of great integrity. A man that said, I don't care what the, even the king says. I'm not going to go against the word of God. I'm not going to go against where my family wants it, where my friends wants it. I'm not going to go against the word of God. I'm going to stand firm. So the next morning they come and tell David, hey, David, he didn't even go down to his house. David says, bring him to me. Uriah comes to him. He gets up there and he says, well, why didn't you go to your house, Uriah? And he says again, 
He said, the ark is out there. Joab's out there. My fellow soldiers are out there. And I'll not do anything that defiles my body into the service of the living God. And, and David says, well, you know what, Uriah, I understand, I get it. Why don't you just hang out one more day, and I'll go ahead and send you back tomorrow. As he starts back out of the palace towards his home, David says, I'll sweeten the pot. Get, get the best ribeyes out of the freezer over there. Get, that, get them things grilled up real good. Send the king's meat with him. Get his belly full. Then go ahead and take him some wine down there and, and just force feed him till he gets drunk. It says he made him drunk. David. Now it's an amazing thing to think that the man that God said, here's a man after my own heart, has fell so deep into sin. And it all started with laziness. Laziness turned into lust. Lust turned into adultery. And then he's lying to the whole kingdom. Joe, you know the story. Uriah comes back the next morning. He says, well, I hate to come to this. Well, let me write a letter for you. I need you to take this letter to Joab. And he hands Uriah a letter. And he gets that letter and he says, just you take that on out to Joab and I'll be seeing you. Now most of us, I believe, most of us would have thought, and this don't make any sense. Um, first of all, why did he even bring me out of the battle? I'm just trying to get the mind of your eyes. I'm walking away from the palace, you know, and I, I it just this don't make any sense. Why he would bring me out of the battle? All he wanted to do was know how the battle was going, and, and that messenger that came and got me could have told him that. Well, why did why did he bring me in here? And then. And then all he wanted to do, he kept wanting me to go to the house. I don't understand that. It goes against the, the word of God. Why would this king do that? And now he's just sending me back this letter. Let's just be honest with ourselves. Most of us would have cracked that seal. Most of us found a bright light somewhere and hold up the light trying to read through the paper. So, the problem with most of God's people, and I'm for you, and I'm part of you, so I can say this. The problem with most of us, God's youngins, God says go, and we say why? Yeah. Right. Right. Do, and we say well, well, well. Most of us are wanting to know what the reward is before we ever do the work. Right. Most of the people today, most people across, especially the lost folks, all they care about is the benefit at the end. Right. Not your eye. Not your eye. Uriah had every opportunity to open that letter. Why all he'd had to done was just broke a seal, read the letter, probably run for the hills. And then he could have put that back down, got a little heat under it, just melted that seal right back to where it was. He could have done it. So how do you know that? I used to do that when the principal sent letters home. <laughs> That's not even true. I don't know why that's come to my head. I, I, that, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to lie to you. I just threw them away. I just threw the letters away, man. Nobody, they ain't no letter got to my house. Uriah stands there. No doubt in my mind, the devil kept saying, look at that letter, 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 read the letter, read the letter. If he would have read the letter, would he have run for the hills? I don't think so. I really don't. Most of us in our lives, if we could have 10 years ago opened the letter and saw what was waiting ahead of us, we'd have shut that letter up and run a different direction. If we could open that letter up and saw the heartache that was waiting up on top of the hill, I'll go around the hill. If we could open up that that letter and saw the trials that we was going to go down through in down in them valleys, we'd have built a bridge. Yes. Not your eye. Your eye said, "I don't understand why he brought me out of the battle in the first place. 
I don't understand what this letter's about, and I sure don't understand why he's sending me back. But I'm going. He was a faithful man. He went back in the battle, and Joab had him murdered. Now, David, it was all David's master plan. He was the conspirator. But David's sin turned Joab into a sinner. David caused Joab to have other men killed. Take him into the battle. Go up to the wall of the city. That wall where other men had been killed just by rocks being flung from it. Take him into the hottest battle. When it gets real hot, y'all pull back and let your eye die. Now, Joab didn't tell everybody that plan. No, he, he had a reputation to protect too. But see, the difference between Uriah and Joab and Uriah and David, Uriah wasn't worried about his reputation. He was worried about his testimony. You know the difference between a reputation and a testimony? A reputation is what other people think about you. A testimony is what you show them you are. Uriah said, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but I'll show you what kind of man I am. I'm just going to live a life with all that's in me to please the God of heaven that saved me from utter destruction, from absolute death, from hell deserved well from all that I had done. It doesn't matter what the world says about me. I'm going to serve God with a faithful testimony according to His Word, with the integrity built up in my heart by the good grace of God, and I'm going to go on for Him no matter what holds. Uriah walks up to the wall, fighting as fervently as he'd ever fought before. And Joe Webb's got that letter in his breast pocket. He looks at the rest of the men and says, Y'all retreat. Don't tell Uriah. Yeah. You know, I have to know in Uriah's life. He walked up. He looked around the army of Israel. He looked at the palace there of Jerusalem. Looked over to the temple. And I thought, how did I get here? I don't deserve to be here. Then David called him back, offered him a, a free weekend. And laying there at the palace gates, he might have thought, how did I? How, why am I here? How did I end up here? And then all of a sudden, now you find your eye. He's on a battlefield. All the other soldiers are gone. He's laying there with arrows pierced through his body. And your eye probably thought, man, how did I end up here? And he looks around. And all those fellows wearing the same uniform he's got on is running. And he looks around, way back off in the corner, he sees something that resembles Joab's chariot. But there ain't nobody around here, right? And your eye says, Lord, all I've tried to do is please you. I went to Jerusalem and I found the king. You know, you know Uriah died thinking that David was good. He died thinking Uriah, or Uriah died thinking that David was a faithful king. And David had a good reputation. And for this, this space of time, and I know he got right with God later on, I know he did. But during this space of time, he had a terrible testimony. See, the, his testimony was this. You read uh, 2 Samuel chapter number 23. It starts out, says these are the last words of David. Read the first eight verses, and it's what God had done through him. Now, verse 7 verses, and verse 8 through 39 starts listing all his mighty men. Names Abishai the chiefest. I've always wanted to be like Abishai. I really, really, I, and I've said that here. I want to have a heart like Abishai. Yeah. And I've always, almost, almost tried to emulate him until I started studying about Uriah. Abishai was a mighty man. 
And it got down to the end of that list. You know who was the last person on the list of David's mighty men? Uriah the Hittite. Why was he at the bottom of the list? It could be because David still felt a little bit of guilt. Or it could be that David said, I've seen something in him that I've not seen in any of these others. I don't know if, you, if you, he had seen Uriah in battle. I don't know if he would heard the story of the heroic things that Uriah had done. But just before he walked out of that gate, carrying his death warrant in his hand, David said, that man's got something in him that I used to have. David said, I, I used to live a life of integrity. I used to live a life that pleased God. I used to care more about what he said than what the people said. Uriah, he's a mighty man. Uriah's laying there on the death when he went into the, on his place that he'll die. He thought, I'm here all by myself. All I've tried to do. See, when he went to Jerusalem, he found a king that was lazy and he lied and he, he lusted after his wife, laid with his wife. Sent him out to die. Murdered him. But laying there outside that city, city wall, taking his last breath, About the time his lungs pushed all the air that he had out of them, as somebody leaned over your eye, says, "Hey, son, I'm the one who brought you out of the Hittites. There's still arrows flying around him." He says, I, I, "I'm the one that gave you that desire to do what's right." I'm the one that gave you enough faith in me that when all the hell comes against you, you can turn your back to it and your face to me. Hey, you're right. Get up. <laughs> hey, you're right. Come on, get up. Uriah stands up, looks around. About that time, somehow, and I don't, I don't have all the metaphysical, meta, whatever in big scientific words. I, I don't know how to explain it to you. Just this is how it happened. He walked away from that wall and walked right off into glory. And he looks around and there's Abraham and there's Isaac and there's Jacob. Wait, well, Lord, over there, there's Noah. There's Moses. And one of them looked around and says, what are you doing here? How did you get here? He brought me. I met a king. My king's never been lazy. My king was building universes before he was ever born. My king built a, a, a church upon himself. My king built a bridge from this world to the glory land. My king has never slowed down. My king has never been lazy. My king's the one that made it all, created it all, and is keeping it all. Amen. Uriah said, oh, I met a king. That's how I got here. I, I don't know where you were when God saved you. I do know where you'll be when we first see our king. The question in my heart today is this. How's your testimony? How's our life? And I cry. <laughs> oh, I'd love to be strong like Abishai. I got a little Abishai in me. You know, they go to cussing the king, and he says, let's cut their head off. That's Abishai. I got a little bit of that in me. But I want a heart of Uriah. Lord, I don't know what's in my letter. I don't know what's, what the future holds. But I'm going to go on anyway. 
And when I lay down and take my last breath, and my king leans over the portals of glory and says, Hey, son, come on, I'm the one that brought you out of the Hittite clan. I'm the one that delivered you from hell and been your help ever since. Come on, let's go home. How'd you get here? And how will we leave? I want to live right. I want to love right. So I can leave right. I'm done preaching. You come. come on, brother. Amen. Amen. I appreciate that preaching. Amen. I think we've all at some point found ourselves somewhere. How did I get here? But I'm glad. I'm glad the Lord is the one that's brought us all to where we're at today. Amen. Well, we've got one more preacher going to take us up to lunch. And Brother Chuck will get him the microphone. And Brother Curtis Ponder, while he's getting hooked up, uh, I appreciate Brother Curtis and the work he's doing there at the Maple Springs Baptist Church. And not only there, uh, the, the work that he's been trying to do down there at the Blacklands Baptist Church. Uh, and he might tell you just a little bit about that. But preacher, when you're ready, come on. Obey the Lord. I appreciate Brother Curtis. He's an old Tennessee boy that God planted down in North Carolina. Amen. Amen. I like it. Amen. God bless you, preacher. Amen. Well, I tell you, Brother Leonard said it. I was going to be the last preacher that takes us up to lunch. And I've got news for y'all. I've got to where I've been eating lunch at 2 o'clock. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> amen. Anyway, maybe. <laughs> Amen. But I do, as I stand here, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis. And while you're turning to the book of Genesis, chapter number 21, uh, as I stand uh, here where I'm standing, I ask myself, Brother Chuck, how'd I get here? How'd I get here? Amen. Uh, and I'm honored to be able to be a part of this meeting. As it's been said, I love Brother Leonard and thank God for this meeting. Uh, first time I ever came to this meeting was over in the old church and uh, thank the Lord we've been able to come through time and time again different times and uh, what, a, what a heritage it is and what a, a testimony in this community how it's helped lives and uh, speaking of helping lives uh, I, I thank the Lord that this time uh, coming up here I've got my wife with me I think it's the first time she's ever been able to come and we've set aside a couple of days to come up here to this meeting uh, for the sole purpose of soaking. Because uh, if you're in the ministry, you know what it's like, amen, to give and to give and to give. Uh, and you just want to come and soak. And um, we talked to uh, Brother Fletcher Monday or Friday, I guess it was, and he asked if I'd preach, and I told him I would. Uh, I didn't come to preach, but I didn't come not to preach. Uh, but I... I'll soak a little bit, but I hope this uh, morning God will let me squeeze a little bit and help you. And I want to help somebody this morning as God has helped me out of this passage of Scripture. Genesis chapter number 21. Uh, I'm not going to take the time to read a bunch of Scripture because I'm going to try to get to a point that I want to just uh, share. I'm going to give you a four-point outline. Uh, I'm going to touch on two, and then I'm going to hunker down just for a minute on two, and we'll go eat lunch. Genesis 21, if you found your place, just say amen. amen. We find in the context of Genesis 21, uh, we see that uh, you know that, that Abraham has, has, uh, has brought a child into this earth by way of Hagar, and they've named that boy Ishmael. Ishmael was born of the flesh. Well, then Isaac gets promised to Abraham and Sarah, and Isaac gets born, and and, uh, and, and, and Abraham and Isaac, or Isaac, excuse me, was born of the Spirit because he was the promised child. So Ishmael was born of the flesh and Isaac being born of the Spirit. Now we find ourselves in this chapter 21, uh, there, there's, a, there's a, what I like to call, and you, if you know me, you'll, you'll understand my, my wittiness and my thinking. It makes it understandable. There's a big boy party being thrown for Isaac. He's weaned, the Bible says. He's got to worry now. He don't need a bottle. He don't need nursed. He's eating a little bit of mashed taters, and he's eating some green beans, and he's coming a big boy. We're going to have a celebration for him. We're going to throw a big party, 
and we're going to have a good time for little old, little baby Isaac, little big boy Isaac, going to have a little big boy party. But then all of a sudden, while we're having a big boy party for Mr. Mr. Spiritual Baby here, the flesh rises up. What's the flesh? That's Ishmael. The Bible tells us it begins to make fun of him, and picking at him, and that's the situation. Point number one, the situation he is that the celebration has turned to chaos. And ain't none of us in here, I know there ain't none of us, because we all, we all exempt from it, but ain't none of us amen, ever had a time in our life where things was just going real good and all was going well, and then all of a sudden all the wellness and all the celebration turns to chaos. And that don't fit none of us. I'm telling you right now, I, I sat back there a while a while ago, and my mind began to go to a lot of y'all's lives, and I know what some of you's been through, Brother Leonard, and we've had the good times, we've had the highlights, and we've been living large and in charge, and all of a sudden, one phone call changes it all. Amen. Your celebration gets turned into chaos. Amen. Let's just go ahead and be honest this morning. Amen. There's a whole lot of chaotic things that's going on in a lot of our lives even right now as we're living and breathing. Amen. So that's where we're at right here. The celebration gets turned into a chaotic time. And, and now all Ishmael's making fun of Isaac and picking on him. Then all of a sudden, Sarah says, no, it ain't happening. Sarah says, you're going to have to get Hagar and you're going to have to get Ishmael and get them out of here. Yeah. And then we find now Abraham having to get to the place in his life where he loads him up with some water, loads him up with some bread, and sends him out of there. Yeah. So I say that's the second point of my, my outline. I ain't going to stay there long. Number one, the situation is chaos. Yeah. Amen. Follow celebration. And then we've got the separation now that we find Hagar and Ishmael. They're homeless. They're exiled. And they're, they're at a place where there ain't nobody out there with them. They're, the Bible actually says it there in verse number 14 that they're wandering around in the wilderness. Yeah. They're at a place where they're all alone, exiled from everybody else. And, and I, I, I'm thinking this right here. I got to move around, but I also got to stay because I got to leave. I also got to think about old Ishmael as he's leaving out of there. That Bible tells us, if you read, Abraham was a very wealthy man. Sure. Had silver and gold and cattle, and he had it all. Amen. But then we've got a, I, I, I've read after some other preachers, and they said Ishmael could have been anywhere from 13 to 16 years old at the time of him leaving home with his mama. Well, I'm thinking this right here. I'm thinking as Ishmael is a walking out and towards the wilderness, he's a looking back over his shoulder to his daddy, maybe Isaac now making fun of him. Ishmael's thinking, dear God in heaven, we had silver, we had gold, we had all the corn, we had all the, the meat we ever wanted. And now Daddy has sent us out here to the wilderness, and all we've got is a little bit of bread and water. Can I help somebody this morning? You might be in a wilderness time in your life, but if we just take the bread and we'll take the water, let the world have all the glory, let the world have all the fame, and be satisfied and content, though we might be separated, if we can just have a little bit of bread and water. Amen. God just might honor that. But anyway... I'm thinking that old boy, Ishmael, probably had every right to say, I can't believe my dad had treated me this way. And again, I know ain't none of us ever, ever made comments. I can't believe God's making us go through this. I can't believe we're having to, I can't believe we're having to go through this. Amen. So don't, don't lay, lay your halo off a minute. Somebody get honest with the preacher for a minute. There ain't none of us, amen, exempt from the storms of life. Amen. But the fact of the matter is, Ishmael's probably saying, probably like a lot of us, would say, why? Why, Daddy? Why'd you do this? Why are you having to send us out here? Could it not have been another way? But friend, if you know about, about your Bible, we're about to get into some honey right here, and it's fixed to help us. The separation. They're homeless. They're hurt. They're humiliated. They felt betrayed. They're now outcast. Hallelujah. But here it comes. Watch this. The struggle ensues right here. The bottle now empty. The bread is gone. The, dis dis the uh, uh, despair has drained her uh, determination and rejection has ripped away her rejoicing and sorrow has shattered her spirit. They're now at an all-time low. And then all of a sudden, the water's gone and the 
bread's gone. <laughs> the Bible, hey, Lord, help me right here. Hold on. I'm, I'm just going to preach to you, man. I'm leaving. <laughs> Amen. And God, the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart sitting back yonder. As I was sitting back there looking to where I was sitting, I was looking up yonder on the side of that bank right there. Y'all hear me? Help me right here, Lord. The Bible tells us that, uh, that Hagar takes Ishmael and lays him under some shrubs. And she goes what would be about a bow shot's distance away. Hey, Amen. I'm just going to preach my heart now, Brother Leonard. I believe I'll quit in a minute. Uh, she goes over here on a, about a bow shot away. And I believe our Bible tells us that she wept. But also the Bible says that the angel of the Lord heard the voice of the lad. I'm about, I'm about to say something right here, and I'll probably get ran out of here and probably want to get to eat lunch with y'all. But here's where my heart is. Mama was over here weeping. Ma, and, and we'll put it like this in Tennessee, in North Carolina terms, she's over here whining. I'm thinking she's, she's weeping. She's complaining about how hard it is. I can't believe Abraham do this to us. I don't know what in the world we're going to do out here. We're out in the middle of the wilderness. But my Bible says that the Lord heard the voice of the lad under the shrub. Now get in my crazy mind with me right here. What's that boy saying? Under that old shrub over there all by himself. Amen. Craig T., I believe he's doing something like this right here. Lord. I've heard my daddy do this before. Me and mom out here in the wilderness, we don't know what we're fixing to do. Mama stuck me up under this shrub over here and she's gone over yonder somewhere in the Lord. I don't know what you're wanting to do out here. But I can remember my daddy talking to you out there in the woodshed. And Lord, if it'd be all right, you sure would come help us. I sure would appreciate it. Bible says that the Lord heard the voice of the lad. It wasn't the voice of the whining mama over yonder, but it was the lad. Now here's what I'm about to say right here, and I know it man that some of our people from church might watch this down the road, but I'm just going to say something right here, and I believe a lot of you other pastors could probably help us. It's a crying shame, Brother Mickey, in the day that we're living, that we've got our young people more in tune with the Lord than we do some mamas and daddies. Amen. When some young people knows how to pray and get a hold of God, but mom and daddy's over here whining and complaining about how things ain't going to lay out together. I say thank God for some young ones that knows how to get in touch with the Lord. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm getting out of here. I, I'm trying to leave. Amen. But the Bible said he's over there in that shrub and he's praying. Lord, help me. Mama's over here whining and weeping. Then the Bible says something happened that the angel of the Lord, I believe it is words, angel of God or angel of the Lord, come to Hagar where she was and ask the question that i like to ask us this morning, Hagar, what aileth thee? Mountain Hebrew means, Hagar, what's wrong with you? Because we up here in these mountains and whether you're in North Carolina and Tennessee, that word ailment, Ailments, something's wrong with you. I mean, there's a lot of people got a list of ailments this long. Amen. What's bothering you, Hagar? What's wrong with you? And I believe the Holy Ghost of God like to sit down in here somewhere this morning and put his arm around you. You say, what's the matter with you? What's wrong with you? Then the Bible says that he opened her eyes. in the middle of the wilderness, opened her eyes to a well. And said, go over there and put your bottle in that well and go give that young one something to drink. I believe I read back up there in verse number 15 that the water was spent and the bottle was empty. What if Hagar had said, well, what good's an empty bottle? Yeah. And set it to the side yeah. and went on deeper into the wilderness. That angel of the Lord would have said, fill up your bottle. What if Hagar said, well, I ain't got a bottle. Yeah. Hey, Lord. Yeah. I'm all over the place. I'm just trying to get to dinner. 
I'm trying to make my, I'm trying to make, I'm trying to drive my life thought home right here, Brother Terry. What I'm trying to tell some of us this morning, Hagar, hold on to your bottle. Though you might be empty. Though we may have poured ourselves out, though we might find ourselves empty, just hold on the bottle. Because <laughs> I sat right back there, <laughs> I sat right back there a while ago and I looked up there in them woods, preacher, and I saw all them dead trees where the leaves have now exited. But in between the leaves, there's some little green shrubs. And I thought, dear God in heaven, I can see myself up here at the Dyson Grove Baptist Church crawling up under one of them shrubs. I don't want to whine and I don't want to complain. I don't want to be bitter and I don't want to get cold. But all I want to do is uncork my bottle and get to the place at Dyson Grove Baptist Church and say, Lord, open my eyes to a well and let me fill up one more time. Amen right here. But listen to me. Amen. Can I close right here? Miss Head, if you come back, Pen, I'm going to quit. We're going to go eat dinner. Here's the thing right here. Amen. Look up in here and listen to me. I got to help us. I'm going to help us right now. Let's set this down. I'm going to break it. Amen. Listen to me. I got to thinking about old Abraham over there at the house after the big boy party got blowed up. And God help me right here. Big boy party got blowed up and Abraham loads up some bread and loads up some water. Hagar, Ishmael, y'all got to get on out of here. Yeah. And in my crazy way of thinking, in my crazy way of thinking, hear me, hear me right here, Brother Wayne. Amen. Abraham turns them in this direction and says, just go this way. Go the way I'm sending you. It breaks my heart to do what I'm doing, but Hagar, I'm telling you, I'm positioning you in the way you need to go. Don't go left, don't go right. What? Said, preacher, how, how do you say, why do you say you did that? Because I can't help but think that out there in that wilderness, Abraham had done and remember a time where he'd put a well there, he put a well there, and he put a well there, and Abraham was thinking, eventually that bottle's going to go empty. But if they'll go the direction I'm telling them to go, they'll find one of them wells, and they'll be able to fill up and get help for their life. When I left Maple Springs in Rhonda the other day, yesterday evening, I could just feel it in my soul. <laughs> that, that God said, go towards the wilderness of Johnson County. You may be a little empty, you may be a little weary, might be a little dusty along the way. But he said, take your bottle and head up yonder and get up under one of them shrubs. And I'll open your eyes and I'll give you exactly what you need. All I'm trying to tell you is what you're going through right now, man of God, Sunday school teacher, Christian, child of God, whoever you are. He's already been there. He's already dug a well for you. What I'm trying to tell us this morning is hold on to your bottle. Don't throw your ministry away just yet. Though it might get empty, and though it might get dry, I'm leaving here. I'm, I'm done. I'm going to be truth with you. I went over to the, went over to the Goodwill to try to find me a bottle. And the reason I went to the Goodwill, because my point was this, typical of the junk that nobody wants at their house, they'll throw it in a box and send it to the Goodwill. And I thought, well, maybe I'll find me an old bottle that I like to use, something that somebody else has thrown away that can be used to be filled up again. Well, Goodwill didn't work. So me and Zeke, my grandson, we went to this antique store down there in Elkin. I'm going to be truth with you. I had no idea that Clorox even came in. Y'all see, some of you carnal-minded people thought this was a liquor bottle. I had no idea Clorox even came in a gold, brown-looking glass jug. But when I found that, it had a lid on and it was empty. I thank God that somebody, some of y'all older folks may remember that. I don't. But I'm glad you do. But uh, hey man, I'm glad that somebody, when they had this Clorox bottle, they didn't just throw it away. 
because it's a reminder to some 51-year-old preacher from Tennessee, North Carolina. It's a reminder that Clorox came in a gold-brown-looking glass jug to remind us, spiritually speaking, for us not to throw our bottles away because I heard a young one back here crying a while ago. They're going to have to know what it's like to tap into a well of living water. And if we throw away old time religion and we don't hold on to what God has given us to keep us here, they'll not know about it. Amen. So I'm just trying to say, oh, you might be a little dry. You might be a little weary. Don't throw your bottle away. Because God's positioning you in a place where you can tap into some water and get some help for your life. I'm saying this and I'm closing. The Lord came to Hagar right where she was, right when she needed him the most. Ain't that right? Bottles empty, bread's gone. Hagar, what's wrong with you? Well, Hagar's thinking this is the end. It's like some of us might be thinking this morning, this is it. I've been to these meetings, y'all. I've been to these meetings. And I ain't too far from it right now. I've been to these meetings where I've come and said, Brother David, I need an answer and I need a word from the Lord right now for the next season of my life. I've been there, Brother Chuck. Lord, i got to have something in these two days. I need to hear a word from you. Hagar thought this was the end. Yep. Hagar thought, I'm done. This is the end for me. Hagar, what's wrong with you? Hagar said, I'm over here crying. He's over there praying. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm at my wit's end. I can't help this situation. But it was then that God opened her eyes. And what, look up in there and listen to me. What she needed was there the whole It wasn't a new well. Instead of sitting there with her eyes closed and whining and complaining and getting cold and indifferent on God, maybe we just open the eyes up. There might just be a well there. But that well would have been no good to her had she thrown her bottle away. Can I tell somebody something? Can I talk to me sitting back there in my seat? Don't throw your bottle away. There's a well. There's a well in the wilderness. I don't know what you need for your life, but preacher, I'm done. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you for the opportunity. And today, as she's playing, you may feel the need to come find a place in this altar. You may have come today and your bottle's empty, but boy, God can fill it up these days. I wonder, she plays today, somebody feel the need of prayer today? You want to just come, gather?